don't hit that skip button because I have huge news for you. The Rewind of the Living Dead t-shirt lives. It is here. It is available to purchase. Oh yes, I'm not kidding. We finally got our Rewind of the Living Dead t-shirt out and it's amazing. It is printed by the same company that prints for Cavity Colors and Fright Rags, which if you're a hardcore horror fan who buys a lot of horror t-shirts, I know I do, you know that's the very best and highest quality because we couldn't do anything less for our fans. It's an amazing full color design designed by Jason Ragosta. It's very cool. It features a zombified myself, a zombified Damon, and it looks just like an awesome horror shirt because that's what we want because we're horror fans too. So we wanted to make a t-shirt that you could really sink your teeth into. Go to rewindofthelivingdead.bigcartel.com. Again, that's rewindofthelivingdead.bigcartel.com to get your t-shirt today. Rewind of the Living Dead is a review show, so spoilers are ahead. The success of George A. Romero's film Dawn of the Dead in Italy, with editing by Dario Argento and a new score created by the band Goblin, gave way to producer Fabrizio De Angelis greenlighting a movie that would be marketed as a direct sequel, which was only allowed thanks to Italian copyright laws. The original choice for a director turned down the project, so the studio turned to Lucio Fulci instead. What he crafted, with a screenplay credited to husband and wife duo Elisa Brigante and Dardano Sacchetti, had no ties whatsoever to Romero's work, and Fulci was much happier when the film was marketed in the United States without being regarded as some sort of sequel. With gruesome effects by Giannetto De Rossi, Fulci ultimately made what would go on to become his most famous film about a woman searching for answers about her father's mysterious disappearance, and it takes her to an island that will soon be overrun by the undead. In the latest episode of Rewind of the Living Dead, we're not getting naked to put on scuba gear, and we are staying far away from the splinters in our eyeballs as we review the 1979 classic, Zombie. Living Dead. I'm Damon Martin. And I'm Patrick Guerra. And Patrick, we will not be getting naked, as I said in the preview, to uh-huh. put on scuba gear, but we will be talking about an all time classic horror film, which was actually released in the United States on this day in 1980, which is part of the reason why we're doing this podcast right now, because technically it's an anniversary for Zombie. Yeah, this is totally kismet because, like, it, I'll let you in on the how the sausage is made over here at Rewind of the Living Dead. Uh, usually after every podcast and before every podcast, Damon and I tend to have a little wrap and we talk about what we're gonna what we're going to do next after every episode. And um, Damon starts looking feverishly on all the different streaming sites to see what's playing. And he just sort of flippantly goes, eh, zombie too, or zombies plan. And I go, oh, well, I love that. We can do that anytime. And uh, I, I go, I'm in. And then you look it up and you go, holy shit. It's, <laughs> if we release this the day that we normally release, it's on the anniversary of its release in the United States. And I was like, well, we can't not do it now. Yeah. It's I mean, zombies like zombies, one of these ones, man. And I, I want to credit zombie right now with something. It, this may sound funny to you, Damon, for but for as much as we have gone over and belabored our history with horror, I never really thought of myself as a horror person, like for the longest time. And it was it was zombie, which I I, I, I had originally seen it as zombie too. Um, I think I credit zombie with me becoming actually enamored with horror. In a, in a, in a, like a deliberate way, because I'd always just kind of been, I'd had the wonderment of it that, that a kid had, but that was the first, I remember I found a like DVD special edition box set. And I think the the box set was even called zombie Two, And it has, you know, an extra DVD with deleted scenes and interviews and all that stuff. That was the first time, like I bought a horror DVD with the intention of like collecting it. And I I've purged. 99% of my DVD collection 
and zombie is still in that collection it's it's still i still have it it's right alongside some of my favorite movies of all time and i do think it's when i finally turned the corner and this was right around 2010 i'm gonna guess 2010 was i think when they re-released it or it was some special edition dvd is when i got it but that it that turned the corner for me damon where i was like i'm gonna be a horror person in it on a deeper level now yeah that's awesome that's really cool to hear and my my relationship with zombie is is not similar but also i have a deeper connection with it for one major reason and that is um you know me i've said it a million times on the show i am a story driven person i like a good story i need a good plot um there is not a good plot in zombie there's not a no. good story in zombie no but i love this movie and like this is one of those rare movies where i don't care you know lucio, lucio fulci We've only done one other movie by him on the show, and that was New York Ripper, which was a whole other episode. Um, <laughs> it was a whole episode. As well. Lu Lucio Fulci was not real deep on the plots in his movies. Now, he did really get some crazy cinematography, and of course, you know, the giallo, the Italian horror, a master of his craft, you know, so everything he did when shooting his films and the films he made are iconic. What was never really iconic about Fulci's movies were the plots. You didn't, really watch, you didn't watch a Fulci movie thinking, man, I'm going to be enamored by this story. You watched it for the great effects and the camera work and the, you know, the, whatever. You watched it for all those kind of, the score. You watched it for all those kind of things. You rarely watched it because you're like, man, this story is so engrossing. Um, <laughs> this is one of those rare movies. Like, like I am a massive george a romero fan we've talked about this the, you know your my version of yours which granted i was like six years old at the time but my version of a, a horror film that got me into horror was night of the living dead it scared the hell out of me when i was a little, little kid and i've been into horror ever since um and we did that on the podcast you know quite a while back and i talked about what an informative movie that was for me i love dawn of the dead that's probably a top 10 horror film for me of all time and dawn of the dead has the George A. Romero version, although I do like really like the Zack Snyder version too, just to throw that out there. Um, but the George A. Romero version actually has a really engrossing story to it. It's a really good yeah. story and acted. Everything about that movie is perfect. This film is usually attached to Dawn of the Dead because of the weird marketing thing that I mentioned in the intro, um, where it was supposed to be a sequel, which it's not at all. There's literally nothing <laughs> to do with Dawn of the Dead in this movie except zombies. Um, but there but the difference with this one is is there's no plot there's <laughs> no story but it's great i mean i love everything about this like rewatching it i rewatched it last night and i hadn't seen it in a few years rewatching it last night i remembered why i loved this movie so i i'm glad that this was like a, a formative movie for you that kind of turned the corner because we all have those movies you know for me it was scream like scream got me back into horror when i was in, yeah you know when i saw scream that was like the movie that reawakened my passion for horror for you. It was zombie. It really was. And you know what I think it is. And you, you talk about this movie lacking plot and the, the, the plot is razor thin, by the way, which is just a woman's father goes missing in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, what, what did they call it? The, um, in one of these Caribbean islands, I forget what they called it. I think it's anyway, a, I think it's a made up island. I don't think it's a real the island. Antilles, which is not a made up island, but it's Matul so, is where he goes. Missing. Yeah, he goes to Matul, which is not a real thing. But anyway, so, yeah, he, he, you know, he goes missing in the Antilles and she goes looking for him. And, and there's a and there's a body that turned up in New York Harbor. And so there, there's a, there's a there's a loose connection that just gets them to the Antilles, basically. And then they go to this Matul Island and there's almost no plot. <laughs> but you know what there is? There's like gutsy filmmaking. I think that's what got me because I remember the first thing I've ever remember about zombie ever, of course, is this the thing I think we all think of, which is that cover shot of the worm eye zombie. Yeah. When, wherever I saw that, I don't remember where I saw it. I, I, whatever I saw it, I said, I've, I'm going to have to see that movie. I need to see the movie where the worms are in the zombie eye. I've got to see it. And then eventually I saw it and I was like, wow, this movie fucks around. Like not a lot of movies fuck around. Like yeah. it, it does some, it does some shit that you don't see in most zombie movies or movies in general. But also they were just like, well, if we're not really going to have a plot, then let's just have things that make people go, Oh shit. <laughs> and I feel like zombie is one of those is one of those movies where you say, Oh shit, at least three, four times. Yeah, absolutely. And this is what, what this along with, you know, Dawn of the Dead, which of course, 
Um, you know, the effects of that movie are incredible. We've praised left, right, and center, the early effects of guys who did, you know, uh, like Tom Savini, guys who did effects on those on those movies, and that's how Greg Nicotero got his start. Of course, he went on to do a, t- a million different movies, but of course he now is like an executive producer and director on The Walking Dead. Um, it's kind of miraculous to me that the effects in this movie are what they are, like especially yeah. the zombies in particular, because I would argue that these zombies, which again, to give credit where credit is due, Gianetto De, De Rossi was the guy who did the effects. Him, I mean, that was the effects. Um, these might be the most gruesome zombies in film history, and that's saying something considering this movie came out in Italy in 1979. Like, and they yeah. still—it's remarkable how much it holds up today. Because when I was watching it last night, and again, it had been a few years since I'd seen it, I was like, "Damn." Like these zombies still look really, really freaking gruesome, and they're you know this is a movie that's forty years old, over forty years old at this point, and and you know we've come so far. And listen, I'm not saying that makeup hasn't come far. You know, listen, you can say what you want about The Walking Dead, but the work that Greg Nicotero and his crew do on that show, they do make some amazing looking zombies, and the yeah. effects they use are amazing in that show. But forty some odd years ago they were doing it in zombie and it was incredible and I would argue these are the best zombies across any zombie film ever. I am with you. And I'll and it's it's funny because like I've been taking you a little bit through my um through my uh my horror story that I'm that I'm working on with my kids, right? That I'm trying to kind of like get them gradually into uh horror and when I, I use a lot of gateway stuff, the monster squad, the lost boys, easy things for them to digest. Well, at some point, my six year old, who I think leans a little heavier onto horror, uh, he got a hold of Michael Jackson's thriller, the, the music video, the very famous music video. And I think I, I texted you while he was watching it. And I was like, I think these are the scariest zombies I've ever seen, realizing that most zombie movies the zombies aren't terribly scary now now modern zombie stuff you mentioned the walking dead and a couple other modern zombie movies they they obviously have the budgets and everything to do it but if pre-walking dead every zombie movie i think was just trying to do what they could do with the money they had yeah and zombie what i love about the 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 zombies in zombie is that they are very thematically specific they feel like zombies that were buried on an island because most of them rose from the grave. There's a couple that are that are dead people that get infected and, and rise again. But especially the classic one on the cover is an old rotting zombie that has been sitting in that Spanish graveyard for a long time. So what you have is zombies that have a very distinct look and the, the attention to detail on them is great. As much as I love the original Night of the Living Dead, they kind of just look like people with a little bit of makeup on and some dark under their eyes. They don't really have, you know, that, listen, they, they did that on, on a shoestring budget. So I'm not blaming them. And I still like that movie very much, but it wasn't like, wow, the zombies in that are so iconic, you know? And then I think about Dawn of the dead, the original, and I go that they're cool, but they kind of look, they look like people in, in powder green paint, you know, it, it's, it, and even return of the living dead, which we, uh, we love like, not not all those zombies like impress me the the gore like impresses me more than the zombies impress the me gore, the gore is where that's exactly what happens in the romero films the gore is where it gets amped up it's not the yes. zombies that are scary it's the gore yes that's scary. you know we talk about when we were doing our design with the great jason ragosta to do our t-shirts i had it in my head that i wanted us to be which by the way you can buy our t-shirts right now on uh, rewindedlivingdead.bigcartel.com uh oh, the, idea, the, the idea the image i had in my head was us eating videotape like they did in dawn of the, in day of the dead when they're ripping apart the colonel or the sergeant whatever he is the military guy and the zombies are eating his intestines and that's a very yeah. famous scene in day of the dead and i was like that would be perfect for us we could turn into our image with us eating videotape because we're you know horror and uh we grew up in the 80s and that's our, our era of horror and so that was where the idea came from so those movies were more about the gore of the zombies eating people or attacking people. It wasn't the zombies that were scary, and that's fine. Yeah, you know, George Romero was basically creating his own zombie. There wasn't a, there wasn't, there really wasn't a, 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 a you know, a template to follow. He was creating his own version of what he thought a zombie would look like, and it was just reanimated dead people. You know what I mean? It wasn't like he was trying to gross them out for the people. They were just eating people. 
And so that was the gross part, the biting and eating people. Um, this film, the zombies are disgusting. The zombies are scary. The conquistador zombies are scary. The way, I mean, they're all kind of scary. And that, to me, was what really separated this film. And I, I listen, I'm, I like zombie movies. I've always liked zombie films. I'm not going to sit here and profess that I know every zombie film ever, so somebody could probably come at me in a comment or on social media or whatever, send me a message and say, no, no, this was not the first great zombie film with really you know, putrid sure. zombies. But in my opinion, this is the first one I saw where I was mm -hmm. like, damn, these, the zombies are scary and what they're doing is scary. And that's what really set this film apart from every other zombie film is because the zombies were scary as much as what they were doing in, in, in the Romero films is more about what they were doing, not the zombies. A hundred percent agree. And I think, I think for that, for that hardcore fan that knows way more about horror than either that, than you or I, they're going to point to some obscure movie. Well, guess what? Zombie is not that obscure. Zombie sort of like the level two. If you've seen Night of the Living Dead, you might you might fall along the lines of an average horror fan or even just a casual or somebody who just happens to see a lot of movies. But the next level up would be Zombie 2 or Zombie. And and uh, I, I do think that, the, that these are the best zombies you're going to see in a movie pre Walking Dead, pre the Walking Dead coming out and everybody getting into getting zombie fever. This was the one where you where you watch these disgusting, decrepit, sandy, you know, like, again, we're in the Caribbean, right? So like, you know, they're, they're, they're not just in dirt, they're in sand. And they're, and I loved the attention to detail. It reminded me of The Walking Dead actually a lot. And this is something that came out, you know, 30 years before Walking Dead. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's incredible. It's, remarkable, it's a remarkable how well it holds up, though. I think that's what was most shocking. Yeah. Watching, watching it on HD last night, I was like, damn, this really holds up. Yeah. It does. You know, you know, it's funny, like watching and I've, we've been watching a lot of this uh, as, as getting the kids hyped up for horror. We've been watching just the highlights of Freddy versus Jason. And once it once it moved over to HD, you could see the makeup in uh, Ken Kersinger's eyes, who's playing Jason. Yeah. And I was like, in Zombie, I'm not seeing that. Yeah. In Zombie, I'm seeing some people who are probably very miserable dressed up like zombies. What I what I'd heard because <laughs> they were probably like, let's glue sand to your eyelids so we don't see your eyelids the right way. So what I heard and what I what I read online from Giannetta De Rossi when he talked about these films and and you know when people had talked to him about this film. He had caked on a lot of mud and caked it yeah. on. Like it was like piles of mud onto these characters and makeup. So like no one, no one who got made up as a zombie was just getting a layer of makeup or even like foam rubber or anything like that. He was caking on makeup. So it was like a thick prosthetic. So that's why you're not seeing anything come through. You're just seeing the zombie because he really apparently just like full on like I know it sounds morbid, but like full on like funeral home caked it on, man. Like they were like spackling yeah. the makeup. And that's why you don't see anything show through because the actors who were doing this were literally just wearing a shroud of mud and makeup to make them look more effective. And it worked. I mean, it's kind of crazy again. They And this film didn't have like a crazy good budget or anything like, and they did it. They filmed it over like seven weeks which is a really short amount of time. I mean, I know they filmed Night of the Living Dead and whatever it was, like three weeks or whatever, but yeah. like, by this standard, even by this standard, like seven weeks is not much. No, for the things that they pull off in this movie, and we should probably start getting to some of those things they pull off because it's insane. But yeah, I mean, seven weeks, very little budget. Let me see if I can pull up a budget here. They have um, a lira. They, I don't know if they yeah, have they have a lira, which I don't know. It's 410 million lira, which sounds like a lot, but I guarantee you that's like $38 or something <laughs> in U.S. in 1979. Um yeah, no, they did this for nothing, but it looks like something really special. It is now it's noticeably like really minimalist. And I made a note of that. I was I go, you know, there's a lot of great zombie movies out there that give you a sense of scale. This does not give you a sense of scale. It looks like, yeah, we found like a corner of an island that we were allowed to shoot on and we shot everything like in this in this small area. The and it, and they Republic, that's where they shot it. The Dominican yeah, Republic. you could tell that they just kind of carved out their little corner of the Dominican Republic and shot it right there. It doesn't feel like a big movie, which yeah. can sometimes screw you over. But in this case, I think it kind of works because it's so plot light. 
it's like they don't i don't need a bunch of different set pieces what i what i just need is to for zombies to close in on these on these uh you know unwitting uh victims and that's what happens so let's let's go back to the beginning because there's a lot of people if there's one like generally speaking people love zombie let's be honest this is an iconic horror film generally speaking all horror fans agree this is an all-time classic but if i if i do hear people bump up against this movie in any way shape or form a lot of people bump up against the opening uh, that you know it's 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 a little meandering it doesn't really go anywhere and it's kind of boring i i disagree i actually really like this opening and I want to mention, so they actually filmed the opening. When you see them go into the newspaper, when we meet Ian McCulloch's character for the first time, the news, the journalist, his boss is Lucio Fulci. I don't know if he knew that. That's his cameo in this film. They filmed it in the actual offices of the New York Post in New York. And apparently during filming, they actually accidentally walked in on a meeting being held by Rupert Murdoch, the current owner <laughs> of Fox, and he got livid. He pissed off and yelled at them, and they had to, like, run out and go the other <laughs> direction. But, yeah, so Lucio Fulci plays the boss of the New York Post, and then, of course, Ian McCulloch plays the journalist. But they find this, uh, they find this drifting boat in the middle of the harbor, and the police show up, which, by the way, the, the dialogue is pretty hilarious. Like, Ahoy, matey! Ahoy! And I'm like, they do not say that. It, by the way, no one says that. Um, and then the police, at one point, they're like, they're like, hey, if we get this in, we'll get some kind of bonus. Like, are you looting the boats that you found in the harbor? Like, is that what you're this doing? This was in the 1970s new york cops so yes maybe but i was like they're like hey if we bring this boat in we get a bonus like what, what are you guys doing are you just looting the boats what's going on here but anyways a lot of people bump up against this opening scene like it drags on a little bit it takes basically what they're getting at it takes them too long to get to the boat because what you got to realize our four main characters well i mean obviously the doctor dr menard is one of the main characters but the four people on the boat the you know the journalist the the daughter of the father who goes missing and then the two randos that they meet on the on the pier that take them to the island they don't even get to the island until like three quarters of the way through the movie like this is like a weirdly structured movie because the four basically main characters don't even get there until over halfway through the movie. Like, they don't even arrive on this, like, haunted island until I'm halfway through the movie. So people, like, bump up against the opening. It takes too long for them to get to the boat, which is once we get to the boats, when we get to the zombie versus the shark, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but be, I actually really like this opening. Actually, to me, the gun, the the shot in the in the shrouded head to open the movie, and then going right into the boat, and it's just this boat just like just wandering through the harbor with nobody on it i don't there's something inherently creepy about that and then when of course when the giant zombie busts out and bites the cop i don't know like maybe i'm just a weirdo but i love that scene i actually really do too i it's in my notes um what it does is it, it does what i was just talking about which is it gives this this story some kind of scope because if you just did it all on the island or started on the boat and with a with a, a a belabored conversation about these two people trying to get to this island to find her dad then this movie has no scale whatsoever because once they hit the island i mean this movie is small and contained and it just sort of just rolls into the zombie stuff so seeing the boat bobbing in the new york harbor with with the new york skyline in the background with police kind of circling it and everything it gives a sense of mystery it, what, what it really does is it does it does what Italian giallo would do, which is it sets up a mystery. Then that that's kind of one of the main rules of a good giallo is there's got to be something we have to ask a question about in the beginning. And then, yes, we get into like a journalist, the daughter of a doctor who's gone missing. OK, these these are giallo setups. This is classic giallo setup stuff. You get that going first, but then it turns from a giallo into a horror film. And there is a difference between those things. Take a look at them. Giallos tend to be slashers. This is not going to become a slasher. It's going to become a horror film. It's going to become a zombie film, very specifically a zombie film. So I like that the, the setup, which is it just kind of world built a little bit. Some of it's definitely dated and goofy and the dialogue does not help it at all because it's a bunch of Italian guys writing what they think Americans talk like. And it sure comes out sounding like that. Um, so, you know, you get that, but like, once you get going, it's fine. And it, and, and I'm, I don't even have a problem with all the New York stuff. I like the boat zombie played by Captain Haggerty, by the way. Everybody's fan favorite boat zombie, Captain Haggerty, has a very 
very long special feature in uh, in the in the in the zombie box set that I I love listening to because you could tell like it was the high point of his acting career to get done up in that makeup and do his thing, um, and it it just it sets the catalyst for the movie, and then we get onto some nutty shit, Damon. I I, th- I think it's nutty enough to have a a boat just floating in the New York Harbor that's insanely hard to shoot. But they continue to up the ante, Damon. Let's talk a little bit about once we get on the boat. There's multiple things going on. Can I mention real quick before we get to the boat? There's a lot of shots that they're shooting that you see from the boat. You're seeing from a helicopter. Aerial Mm -hmm. shots. Now, if you're curious about these aerial shots, because that costs money. Yeah. Aerial shots cost money. You know what doesn't, though, is when you pay for a sightseeing trip, around new york city in a helicopter and you just tell them you're going to bring a camera with you every shot that you see the aerial shots in this film the zombies on the bridge at the end the the boat at the beginning in the harbor that is literally them paying like 30 bucks for a sightseeing tour (laughs) and they're up in the helicopter shooting with a camera that's every shot you see from the aerial shot is them paying for a sightseeing tour (laughs) and shooting from the sightseeing helicopter it's ingenuity folks that's, That's amazing. cheap. That's amazing. That is dirt cheap. By the way, they probably don't let people bring cameras up there anymore. I guarantee you, because they were, they were like, I don't know, a bunch of Italian guys rented it out like six, seven different times, and I guess they put it in a movie without crediting us or, you know, the, a helicopter. They're going to charge you something in the order of ten thousand dollars a day, roughly, to shoot to shoot movie stuff. So yeah, they oh, got away. They got They got away with a lot by doing that yeah. that's a smart way to get that done yeah so they they get to the boat and they meet they meet our new entries into the so we're we're, we're dealing with four main characters as you said here we're dealing with four main characters we've got um of course we got brian we got susan his girlfriend we got ann uh ann bowles who is the daughter and then peter west who is the new york journalist with a british accent um because ian mccullough said his american accent sucked so he didn't try to do an American accent. Uh, so Ian McCulloch, so yeah, so those are our four characters. Once they get on the boat, and they basically, the the, the, the couple are getting ready to go on a cruise. They're basically going like a, what did they say, a month-long cruise to the Caribbean or whatever. Something like that. They're, they're like, you know, can we tag along? We're trying to go to, what is it again, Mapool or Madul? Matul. Matul. We're trying to get to Matul. And Brian immediately is like, whoa, we hear spooky things about that island. And Anne's like, well, my dad's there. Which, by the way, Anne, of course, uh, played by Tisa Farrow, the sister of Mia Farrow, the great Mia Farrow from Rosemary's Baby. That's her sister. Um, She's like, my dad went missing. I'm trying to look for answers. A little bit of a sob story. And Brian's like, hop on board. We'll get you to Matul. Come on. That's a mad living here. Uh, (laughs) And then once they get on board it's it's the shit gets italian it's the weirdest (laughs) boat journey of like okay let let's okay we're gonna get to the zombie and the shark in a second that's the one everyone's waiting for right that's the scene oh yeah but first we we have to address the scuba diving which i joke about in the intro aretta gay who is the actress playing susan she goes out to put on her scuba gear and in classic Lucio Fulci form, she just gets completely nude. Well, she's wearing underwear. Yeah. Nude otherwise. Now, I'm not a scuba expert, Patrick. I'm not. So I'm not going to sit here and profess that I am. But last time I checked, you probably don't go scuba diving nude. Uh, you know what? Truth is, I don't know because I'm no scuba expert. Here's what I do know. That I, I'm sure that this is probably not a big deal, especially in Italy, to just be like, you know what? Like. We don't need a scuba gear. The water's warm. Just just go in your in your in your bathing suit bottom and you're good. I, I think it's a totally normal thing. What what the thing is that makes this not normal is that Italian directors are just inherently horny. And so like the the scene of her like getting undressed is not that big of a deal. Like you're like, okay, that's fine. Like whatever. This is the 70s and we know we know we're dealing with Italians, not a big deal. It's what he adds to the scene, which is then he turns the camera to peter who is the new york reporter showing him like basically licking his chops watching her undress (laughs) i i promise you the scene would not have played sexual without that that part of the shot 
Well, they, and they do a lot of like slow, like draw cameras down her body and stuff. And I'm just like, good lord, guys! Like, come on now, like you guys <laughs> really had you. I mean, but but that's that's Italian horror. It's Italian. Oh, it's Italian I, movies in general. And, and I've said this on the show before. Like, it maybe it's sacrilege to say this is a horror fan, but I'm not the biggest Italian horror movie fan. I do like certain Italian horror films, but I'm not like. I'm not the audience typically. I'm not the one banging down the door to see every Italian horror film. I'm just not, it's not my favorite genre. Uh, but I do, and I watched enough of them to understand that, you know, just like we talk about like color palette and giallo films are so important. This is an inherently Italian thing. I mean, you know, there's the scene with the, the wife in the shower, same kind of thing. Yeah, we just see the zombie. There's a zombie peeking through the <laughs> windows, but it's inherently sexy because they keep peering at the <laughs> naked woman. Um, but yeah, peeking it's zom. Yeah, it was yeah peeking zom. There you go. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was just that like Peter literally just like eyeing her up and down, doing the full on like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's like if without that shot, this, this <laughs> completely normal day of skin diving, you know, in in the Caribbean. Yeah, so she she falls backward into the ocean, and that's when shit gets real. Oh, my Uh, God. This has got to be... Okay. Realistically, and we'll talk about how they made it in a second, but realistically, from execution to the reality of how they made it, okay, this has got to be, what, one of the top five craziest scenes in film history and... History. I I say top five... Not because it's so batshit you can't believe it, but because it actually works. Because mm-hmm. I just saw an advertisement before we went on the air about an hour ago. I was watching TV. And they put up an advertisement for the 10th anniversary of Sharknado, which is the most one of the most ridiculous batshit movies of all time. And <laughs> the graphics and the effects in that movie are utterly ridiculously bad. I mean, they, they made it knowing. Yeah, they, it's they know what they're doing. It's a tongue-in-cheek movie. But it's like hilariously like that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying like okay that's just over the top and ridiculous to the point where it's just stupid. This one is so ridiculous but it actually works which is remarkable for a zombie fighting a shark. It's insanity. I remember I I remember watching this and going what the fuck like they're fighting a real shark. You know, and and listen, I know you're sensitive to animal issues, and so am I. Um, they they sedated the shark, I guess, is what they did to get this to happen. But well, they also wa- they fed and they they fed they fed it healthily first, so it was not a hungry shark because a hungry shark is very unlikely to attack. Um, so they fed it real well first, then they gave it a little bit of a sedation, and then they just got some, what was it, a Mexican dude? Like a, well, like a Mexican shark diver or something? So originally they had an actor picked out for the role, but apparently he couldn't do it for whatever reason. So the guy's name is Ramon Bravo. He's a Mexican stuntman and shark trainer. He was the one who was working with the shark in the scene to get it ready. But when the other guy either couldn't do it or didn't do it, I can't remember what the exact story is, Ramon Bravo stepped in got made up as the zombie and he ended up basically working the zombie himself and he was familiar with the zombie so he or familiar with the zombie familiar with the, the shark so he knew the you know how it moved and things like that he understood how to treat it so it would do it properly and the craziest thing this was the one that blew my mind about this whole scene and you know credit of standing applause for ramon bravo which by the way is like the greatest name ever uh, if I ever go on the run, I murder someone, I go on the run, just look for Ramon Bravo. That's the name of the um, He held his breath. Yeah. There were no tubes. There was no, no air tank. There was no. no special thing. Like, he came up. No. He held his breath. Yeah. During a fight with a fucking shark. I and and who I can't even begin to guess how hard it was to shoot this scene. I just uh, last year shot something on the shore where we got into the water about chest high, and that took an immense amount of work to make it successful. It looks great. The shot looks great. They took a film camera, got it into some sort of waterproof housing, which was probably the size of a small tank. Jump in the water. This guy feeds a shark, sedates it, and then just jumps in in zombie makeup, which how is that working underwater? I don't know. 
credit to the zombie makeup people. And then they have a very convincing fight. I mean, very convincing with a shark. And Damon, on this last viewing, it hit me like a ton of bricks that it's not just a shark. It's a tiger shark. <laughs> yeah. The notoriously most dangerous shark to humans. If you've ever heard of a shark attack, 90% of them, 99 maybe, are from tiger sharks. They are the most human aggressive shark, that and bull sharks. It's a fucking tiger shark and a big one, like a big one. And I was like, oh my God, like, how do they, how do they pull this off? And then when I hear that they fed it and they sedated it, I'm like, wow, that's more credit than I would have given a, 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 a spunky Italian crew in 1979, but they did, they did what little homework that they did and turned out one of the most insane scenes I've ever seen in film history, period. I mean, it's like I'm talking, I just went and saw the new Mission Impossible. They do a lot of practical stunts. You know, um, I'm a big fan of uh, Buster Keaton, who, who was an incredible stuntman in the silent era, did things that I still don't see people do today. This is right up there in film history, but it's, it's one of the most insane scenes you will ever see. Okay, let's also mention that, okay, you know, A, you're still dealing with a shark, okay? I don't care how much it's a shark. sedated, whatever. Ramon Bravo, greatest name ever, had to get close enough to let the the shark bite his arm off. Like, it's a yeah. prosthetic arm, obviously. It's not, thank God it's not his real arm, but, like, that's how dangerous this was. He had to get close enough that the shark bit his arm off. Because I remember when I first saw this, and I... <laughs> I don't remember how old I was. I, I had to be probably, I was probably like maybe like 21, 22. So I wasn't yeah. like that old, but I wasn't super young either. But I remember thinking to myself, I wonder how they did that because there's no way they would do that with a real shark because it's such a ridiculous thing to do, dangerous thing to do, to literally have a shark rip your arm off and that's your fight scene and the zombie's biting the shark. Yeah. I mean, it is, I mean, it is unbelievably, I mean, I, they would never in a billion years do this today, which is why it blows me away that they did it, but it holds up. It still holds up. Like, Jaws is probably top three movie for me all time. Just watch, it was actually on earlier, that's where I saw the Sharknado commercial, Jaws was on. I love Jaws. We'll do Jaws one day on this show, it'll take like three hours, because it will be a full-on Damon Flating this movie episode. <laughs> But one of the most famous scenes in Jaws is the scene where Hooper, played by Richard Dreyfuss, is down in the shark cage. And Jaws, the great white, gets tangled up in the cage and he's thrashing back and forth and they're all you know, freaking out up on the boat on the orca and he rips it away and that's the scene. That was actually footage from a real shark in a different setting. They were trying to get footage of sharks and it got, it got caught up on a cage, but it was little. Like, the shark was like, I think they said like maybe like a 10-foot shark. It was nowhere near the 25-foot shark they were trying right. to portray in Jaws. But they had to use that footage. They made it look what it looked like, and then they interlaced that in the, in the movie because they knew there was no way they were actually going to get a shark big enough and, like, near a cage to attack Richard Dreyfus. You don't do that. Like, even like Steven Spielberg's like, nope, can't do that. We're going to use this footage. And they had real underwater divers underwater shooting the footage. So, like, there was danger there, I guess. And, like, the, the shark really did get caught up in a in a cage like that, and it thrashed. And that's the scene you see from under the water. But even you know, even in those days, that was 75. Even then, like, in, like, the maverick of, of filmmaking, they're not like, no, nah, let's put a real person down there to fight a shark. No, <laughs> of course not. But Lucio Fulci, in his wisdom or insanity... Is like, sure, we could pull this off. Where's Ramon Bravo? Bring me Ramon Bravo. Yeah, I've heard about this Ramon Ramon Bravo guy. Let's get him in here. And Ramon's just like, yeah, fuck it, let's do it. Oh, you gotta put you gotta put zombie makeup on. I don't give a shit. Let's do it. I can hold my breath. Let's go. It just it holds up, man. I was watching it last night and I'm just like, how does this still work? This is I know. Movie. This I I know I already said it about the zombies, but that scene in particular, it still holds up. And especially the arm biting it, especially that part. That was because I was like, at first I was like, oh, I can see how they're kind of cutting around it a little bit. And sometimes you can see this shark's a little lethargic. But then there's a moments like where he bites the shark and I'm like, well, fuck, he just fucking bit the shark. There's no way. But the one that really sells more than anything is as the shark is taking off 
and his arm is in the shark's mouth and the shark rips it and kind of whips it a little bit and then the and then like green cloudy blood like goes goes flowing in the water i'm like oh my god like can you imagine and by the way back then they didn't know if they had the shot or not they went out there they shot it and then they went back to the processing and hoped it worked out they and then they looked at the dailies and went fuck we got it great it's like just, insane filmmaking it's just like i remember a story years ago uh i'm sure you remember this when uh when a chimpanzee escaped the the zoo and it attacked a woman and basically ripped her face off do you remember that the whole story years I've, ago? I've known a few stories and, like that and, and in the in the news and there's a comedian i want to i wish i could remember the comedian that said it because i gave him full credit just so you know i'm not like carlos mincy in this material here i didn't want to steal it <laughs> But there was a, a bit about it, and somebody, the comedian, was like, uh, you know, the, the, the chimpanzee went crazy. He's like, no, he didn't. The chimpanzee went chimpanzee. <laughs> he didn't go crazy. He went chimpanzee. Like, you can't expect a wild animal, even though it lives in a zoo, to just suddenly be, like, you know, just eliminate its instincts. You know what I mean? Like, you can't <laughs> be surprised, like, when some moron falls into a lion cage and the lion mauls it, and they're like, oh, who would have thought that could happen? Anybody with a brain would know that would happen. And so to get into the water, whether I don't care if you fed it a cow beforehand and you you pumped it with every drug known to mankind and gave it weed and everything else, I don't know what else. <laughs> weed. It's still a shark. You know what I mean? You're you're and you're a tiger shark. A prosthetic arm up to get it to bite it away, and you're just hoping he doesn't like. Hmm. Maybe if I reach back another foot, I can get a head in there. It boggles my mind, Patrick, that they did this. <laughs> That's, it's so worth the price of admission. Can you imagine going to see that? And it's probably like a midnight showing, 1979. You're in like, you know, you're you're wherever you are. You any town USA? Oh, let's see the zombie movie. Let's see what this is all about. And you see a guy fight a shark, and you're just like, I think that really just happened. I'm pretty sure I just saw a guy fight a shark. It's because you, you kind of did. You, you had pretty. I, it renders me speechless every time I go, I can't believe these fuckers did it. They did it and they pulled it off and it looked good too. Like it could have, it could have looked bad and you'd still be like, well, that's cool. Cause they tried it. Yeah. They tried it and it looks good. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's just, I don't, I, and like you could, you never could nor should do something like this again. No, uh, never do that. <laughs> but when I read the research on this, I was like this, I mean, it's, I, I'm blown away and I'm glad it exists because it's an incredible movie. It's a scene that still holds up to this day. We're spending like 20 minutes talking about it on our podcast. Um, but yeah, let's not let's not revisit this because there's going to be, if there's a zombie sequel, it's going to be the guy who actually gets his head bit off by the shark when they try to do it the next time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this guy just wants to kill himself. So he I goes would, and yeah, does that. Remote, Ramon, stay away from this. Is all I'm telling you, buddy. Uh, yeah, it's just I, I like when I read, like I when I saw this movie when I was younger, twenty one, twenty two. I was just like, oh, that looks really good. I wonder how they did that because I, in my head, like it's just one of those things you couldn't fathom them doing it. You couldn't fathom. I mean, it's like, I mean, we hear all these stories today about Tom Cruise doing the stunts of Mission Impossible and hanging off planes and jumping off cliffs with, with motorcycles, and you're like. Dude, like, I applaud you for doing it, but, like, I'm pretty sure one day we're going to read a story about, well, Tom Cruise didn't make it through Mission Impossible 12. Uh, right. Because that you don't do that. Like, that's the point. You don't do that. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it's just, like, this thing, like, I'm glad it exists. I'm glad we can talk about it. It still holds up. It's amazing. As I said, top five scene all time. But please don't ever do this again. <laughs> 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 yeah please please my good we have the one we have the one we don't need any more yeah i wonder how many takes they did on that thing though that's the one thing i never i couldn't find anything on you said the schedule was seven weeks total seven weeks total i bet they spent a week shooting just that scene i mean if if i'm to guess because it's not but, like but, but like they said they fed it and said it, I, I doubt they had i don't that i think they could only feed it and they couldn't do it all the time and like they're depending on the shark being there like they didn't film it in like a tub of water. Like it was in the ocean. It was in like in that yeah. area, the Dominican Republic. So like they had to like the shark trainer Ramon Bravo, greatest name ever. Uh, he was a he he was a shark trainer, so he was familiar with that particular shark. So obviously he had some sort of marker or something on it. That he knew it was that shark. 
But, like, I can't imagine you could just call it like you would a dog. We're like, come here, boy. Come here. We're going to shoot a scene today. So, like, I imagine they probably had to shoot all that in, like, one day, right? Like, they couldn't keep. I don't know how you could pull that off in one day. I just don't know. It's just, it blows my mind. It absolutely blows my mind. I can't imagine. I mean, I think that they probably pulled off, like, the arm bite in one day. They'd be like, well, we hope we got it. And then check the dailies and okay, we got the, I looked at the dailies, we got it, but I don't know how they could pull off the entire scene in one day. They, I mean, they, they, they must've had to like hovered around while the shark was in, in that area and kind of kept him on the hook, like knowing, oh, he's going to come here to feed. I have no idea, but it's fucking crazy. Yeah. Unbelievable. I just, it's crazy. Now let's talk about part two of crazy scenes in zombie. And this is the other most iconic scene in zombie. And that is where lucio fulci goes full italian because mm. we know we did this i know we again we've not reviewed a lot of italian horror films we did new york ripper which is one of the funnier episodes we <laughs> that's the lost episode that we released i think earlier this year i want to say it like maybe yeah we released it um go back and listen to that one it's rather funny um one thing you notice about a lot of italian horror films is they really have like a weird fetish with torturing the eyeball Mm -hmm. uh, they have a real eyeball fetish in italian horror films and lucio yeah lucio fulci didn't go crazy lucio fulci went lucio fulci yeah he went uh, fulci with this scene in the in the doctor's house when the zombie attacks the doctor's wife dr bernard's wife the other iconic scene from this film which is zombie stabbing woman through the eye with a shard of wood oh my god uh, this was another memorable moment this is I watched this and I don't remember if I bought the DVD before watching the movie or I, I don't know how. And I, th I think I might have actually done that because I just wanted the zombie from the cover anyway. But when I sat down and watched that and I'm looking at the scene and, and of course, they're already doing great tension building in the scene. They built up the scene really well. And then they get to that moment where the zombie arm comes through the slats in the door and creates these splinters. And then it's cutting to her eye and then it's cutting to a POV of the splinter and back to her. And back. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then she's getting then a profile shot where she's getting closer and closer. And I was like, cool. Any other movie, they cut away or they go in for a little tight, a super tight shot of the splinter hitting the eye or something. They just they they're always cutting around this moment. Not Lucio Fulci. Huh. Lucio Fulci says what we're going to do is we're going to take a whole plaster of her head we're going to make a prosthetic of her face and we are going to in a nice big wide shot very clearly watch this splinter completely rupture her eyeball and tear the side of her face out it's a thing of beauty damon it really is it's just, i to say we're going to go for it and they go for it and then you know she's got the, and she's got a great scream i don't know who actually did the scream because i know a lot of it is usually overdubbed Whoever did the scream did an incredible, like blood curdling scream while this, while I'm watching the side of her face get torn open, while I'm watching her eyeball get torn open. I love Gore Damon. This is up there. This is up there with my favorite Gore of all time. Yeah. The, the actress who played the role is Olga, uh, what was the name again? Olga, Olga Carlotto. Carlottos. Yeah, Olga Carlottos is the actress who played that role as Mrs. Menard or the doctor's wife, really. And what I didn't remember again. You know, I always say it, watching through the critical eye. What I didn't realize until watching this movie, uh, which, you know, I've seen it numerous times, but again, hadn't seen it in years. I forgot how drawn out that scene is. Like, how just, like, it, like, it is tortured. It is really tortured. Like, it's one thing to see her, like, you know, hiding behind the door, trying to move the dress in front of the door, and, like, trying to be a beat off the zombies, trying to break in. And you're not really sure what's going on. But then when the zombie breaks through the wood and actually gets a hold of her and he's like drawing her in closer and closer and closer to the shard of wood, and you're sitting there going, no, 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 no. It is really drawn out. Like it is not a quick death scene. Like it no. is full on, like it is torture to watch. Um, I had kind of forgotten how long that was. Like I, everyone remembers the scene of the splinter going in the eye and the blood curdling scream and then the, and the gore. I didn't remember how long that scene was in particular. Like, I'm not saying it was like 30 minutes long of her getting her eyes gouged out, but like, even, I think it was like a full minute of her like struggling against the zombie and then just like inching closer and closer and closer. And it's a real slow, 
Like he doesn't like he doesn't take the head and just slam it into the no. into the into the uh, into the splinter. He like slowly pushes her into it. Like imagine taking a toothpick and you know you like prick your finger with it and it hurts. Imagine just taking it just slowly like digging into your skin. How much that would hurt. That's what he was doing. It was so it was so visceral gutsy gutsy filmmaking to just go take our time with it right like they they do a great buildup, and then their release is also like great it's not just a little release it's a lot of release and they really they really go all out and these this is why this movie stands out because i think a lot of other movies and granted you know maybe a lot of movies have tried it and not succeeded i feel like terrifier 2 succeeds uh very much so um, but it's it, probably in the spirit of this. If you, I bet if you ask Damien Leon, what's your top favorite gore in, in the history of uh, uh, horror, I, I bet Damien puts this somewhere in the top three easily. Yeah. It's just such an iconic and incredible look. Well, the entire film, I mean, obviously this this scene we're talking about, and I know we've already talked a lot about the look of the zombies, but even the ending sequence when we're in the medical clinic and they're having a full-on like Molotov cocktail party <laughs> with the zombies, like, again... As I said, this film is very, very light on plot, very, very light on story, but the action sequences and the horror scenes are so good that you kind of forget about the fact that you're really not seeing a lot of story or a lot of great dialogue or a lot of like, yeah. you know I mean? like plot, it, it, like this film, watching this again, like even though I'm not as big of a fan and I know you are. But like this, watching it this time, I, I was literally sitting like halfway through the movie, and I'm like, I kind of understand a little bit better what Patrick sees in Friday the Thirteenth now, because even though I'm not as much of a Friday the Thirteenth fan, because uh, to me it gets a little repetitive, and you know some of the gore is not as good in certain films, and I do like I do like a lot of the Friday the Thirteenth movies, but I also do like the ones I like the best are the ones with like a really cool story or at least a cool twist in there, uh, like Part Two and Part Four in particular. Um, but watching this with the kills and, and the really graphic kills and the, and the zombie bites, I was kind of started to understand a little bit more about why you like Friday the 13th, because Friday the 13th, very much like zombie, very light on story, very mm -hmm. light on plot, but you're watching it to watch Jason Butcher people. And it's kind of the same thing here where you're not really watching for an, you're not watching for a, an Academy, Academy Award winning screenplay. Uh, you're watching it because of the zombie action and because of the gross kills. And so, like, that's where this film exceeds. It is not an, a great story. It is not a great plot. It's not great dialogue. But it's incredible action, and the, the effects are, are just off the charts. It's like the Mission Impossible of zombie of zombie movies. It's like, you're not going to get a lot here, but, why, but, but wait till you see the tricks we got for you. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. So am I right in the comparison to Friday the Thirteenth a little bit? Like that's kind yeah, of yeah, oh, absolutely. And I think it's why Zombie is is holds such a special place for me. You know, amongst all my zombie films, is is just like man, like when they go for it in this movie, they really go for it. What I said earlier, gutsy filmmaking, it just works. It works if you go. I'm going to create some key moments in this movie that you're not going to forget. You know, we we, we combed over quite a few of them already like we re we really have that it just creates a bunch of moments in a movie that probably if you went story-wise it'd probably shrink this down to about 40 minutes if you just wanted the story yeah can didn't I, really need the story can i mention real quick one of my favorite moments of the movie which is one of the funnier moments uh, at the end before we get to categories um when they get back to new york and they realize that the zombie invasion is also happening there which by the way they go back to the origins of zombies which is voodoo is yep. this movie which is different than every other version I, I, in most versions we don't know why it happened we just know it happened but they actually say it's voodoo in this film um my one of my favorite shots which is like the total guerrilla filmmaking aspect of this film that cracks me up every time i watch it is they get to the radio report when they're coming back and they're just like they're attacking they're in the building and you're like oh my god it's attacking new york and then you see the zombies walking over the brooklyn bridge and there's still cars zooming oh yeah by. 
And I'm like, yeah, this was before you could really edit that out because if there was a zombie attack in New York at this point. You kind of imagine people would just be driving to work. But it's really funny because if you watch on the upper decks of where they're following the zombies walking, there's just cars zooming by. Oh, yeah. way. No ambulances, no like emergency vehicles, just a bunch of cars going to work. I thought that was <laughs> hilariously like perfect for the end of this film. And accidentally shows just how hard it is to get New Yorkers to fucking notice anything. Yeah. But <laughs> on the radio, they're like, uh, the zombies, zombies are getting me. Ah! Yeah, it's crazy. The whole city's falling apart. Oh my God. And then you see <laughs> the cars zooming by. The city's falling apart. Drive time still uh, considered about an hour back up on the LIR. <laughs> <laughs> it's like well that's still happening that just cracked me up because they zoom out just a little like if they would have just kept a little tighter shot of the zombies walking across the brooklyn bridge it probably would have worked but they did a little bit too much of a zoom out and <laughs> i not watch this movie without seeing the cars it just every time i see it it just sees the cars zooming by and it cracks me up and i don't want no george lucas bullshit where they come back in and erase the cars or anything like that leave it in we like it we want it there it's too funny. Every time I see this movie, when I watched it last night, I was like, oh, that's hilarious. I was like, I always remember that. I always remember the cars. <laughs> All right, let's get into categories. And as I said earlier in the show, by the way, before we get to categories, I want to mention we do still have our Rewind of the Living Dead t-shirts for sale. Uh, if you want one, buy one. They are limited edition. They are high quality, great shirts. So purchase one now. Go to Rewind of the Living Dead dot big cartel dot com sizes small to two XL and uh, they will ship directly from my house. They're sitting right behind me right now. So go buy a t-shirt, support the podcast that way. We certainly appreciate it. Patrick, our categories are a little different this week because let's be honest, this isn't a movie that is going to win anybody awards in terms of acting while there are some fun <laughs> roles. So rather than best performance or even favorite character, we're going to kick things off with what really matters with this movie. And that is, best zombie so patrick when it comes to zombie what is your best zombie damon you can't spend uh, a third of your show talking about the reef zombie without giving credit to the damn fighting shark zombie first of all fantastic performance by ramon bravo greatest name on earth, greatest name on earth. okay ramon bravo D does put out the best performance in this movie. Even if we don't have a best performance category this week, the best performance was 100% Ramon Bravo's uh, Reef Zombie. It's it's one of the most incredible sequences I've ever seen in a movie, and it takes a real human and a real shark and puts them together in a most perilous situation. Uh, performance hand, Best performance, hands down. And as I keep saying over and over and over again, I, I don't want to keep hammering this nail, but it looks good. Like, that's the thing. Like, underwater, they're shooting mm -hmm. this thing. Like, where makeup falls apart. Like, if you've ever yeah. done any kind of effect, the one thing you don't want is water. That will show you where your effects are coming from because you don't want that. You really have to work hard to make it work in water, especially in 1979. Uh, <sighs> they actually made it look it good. Like, they actually made it look really good, and it still holds up to this day. It really does, man. I just, and you, it, that's a really important part the zombie itself because this is the best zombie category stays looking like a zombie yeah. and then to to sell it to continue to sell that yes indeed this is a zombie the shark bites its arm off and the zombie keeps going with his trail of green zombie blood i mean come on it's, it's hands down it's the best zombie so now we know that zombie bites are what turn you into a zombie we see that several times in this film did the zombie create a zombie shark Fuck yes, he created a zombie shark. <laughs> I, because I have to have that exist. It has to be a thing that's real. Imagine going in the water and you're already scared to death of sharks, and here comes a zombie shark for you. That's, that's <laughs> you're great. Level. Whole other level. Um, okay, so you talked about the, the you talked about the great Ramon Bravo, greatest name on earth, um, as the reef shark. And so again, I would love to I would love to sit here and, and try to pick some obscure zombie from this film, but the one I picked is the iconic one from this film. I call him the conquistador zombie, the one on the cover, the worm eyed zombie. And the reason I picked it, that zombie isn't because it's the iconic one from the cover. It, it, it does look great. It's the emergence of the zombie from under the dirt. Yes. And it comes up like the slow reveal. And then when he finally appears, you see the, the worms in his eyes and the, 
the grill all messed up and the dirt everywhere in the eyes. It was just, it's just a really cool looking zombie in that moment, but it's the emergence of how that zombie appears from under the ground and kind of digging itself up out of the dirt and sand and then emerges in front of uh, the nudist uh, scuba diver. And uh, it's just a really cool reveal. And I know it is the one on the cover and it's the one everyone sees when you see zombie. But if you know this movie and you watch this movie, there's a reason they put that zombie on the cover because it looks fucking awesome. It is that good. It's a great reveal. And I love that you mentioned it like coming out of the dirt. They really sell like I think they sell that better than I think a lot of the movies do. Like I really believed that these zombies were sitting there buried for a very long time. They just look like it. And they had that great little trick shot. It's, it's not even that big of a deal of a shot where they go POV of the zombie emerging from the dirt. So you see what it looks like to watch the dirt fall away from their eyes. Never mind that he doesn't have eyes. One eye's full of worms, the other eye doesn't exist anymore. They still bothered with that POV shot as the zombie rises up out of the dirt. It's just a bunch of cool little tricks like that that just make this special. Yeah, it's a really cool looking zombie. And again, there's a reason they put it on the cover because it does look great and it is an iconic zombie and it works really, really well. And of course, um, yeah, it's just everything about that zombie looks really cool. And I, that's again, even though it's on the cover, I know it's the one everyone knows. Like it's the one, it's the shark zombie, the, the reef zombie and this zombie, the ones I always remember from this film. Like when I think of zombie, I think of these two zombies. And like I said in the beginning, I think the whole reason I ever got fascinated with this movie is because I remember that image before I saw anything, the image of the eye worm zombie. And I think it's one of those images like everybody in horror knows it. When you see that image, you know it's a zombie. Also, real quick, I want to give a credit. We're going to talk about best scare in a moment. This isn't my best scare, but one of my favorite reveals in this movie is when the, the four people from the boat are running from the doctor. They, they run from the doctor's house. They get in the car. They crash the car. Then they're trying to walk back to, to get to the uh, clinic on the other side of the island. And uh, when they walk and they realize that they're standing in the middle of a graveyard and it's the Conquistador graveyard, it's a really cool reveal when you see, like, uh, uh, Tisa Farrow's laying on the ground and the zombie grabs her hair from underneath the ground. Yeah. And you realize they're all laying on gravestones. I just love that reveal. It's a really cool reveal in this film, like, when you realize they're, like, basically hanging out in an old graveyard without knowing. Yeah. It. Yeah. Unbeknownst to them, they're standing in a graveyard. As yeah. a voodoo curse runs rampant. Yeah. So let's talk about best scare because there's quite a few in this movie, whether you're talking about traditional jump scares, you're talking about uh, gross out gore scares. There's a lot of different kinds of scares in this movie. So Patrick, what was your best scare in zombie? Mine was a little more subdued. I loved um, the, the doctor's uh, wife being stalked by the zombie. It, it is like you said, a, a more drawn out scene. It starts with the zombie outside and then she gets out of the shower and then she's drying off. And then there's this moment that I just fucking loved. And I don't know what it was about it, but she goes to try to close the door and the door won't close. And she's like kind of struggling with it a little bit. And then the zombie reveals himself. I don't something about that caught me so viscerally. It's like, just imagine if you're on vacation in, in some island resort and you know, you know, if you've ever stayed near an, uh, on an island or something like that, like not everything works perfectly. It's there's a lot of exposure to the elements and salts. It's not crazy for you to be like struggling with the door. Well, how fucked up would it be if when you're struggling with that door? It's because there's a fucking zombie on the other end and you were not ready to see one. I, I love the scare. I love that scene. As I said, I didn't remember being so drawn out, which made it that much more terrifying this time around. Yes. I kind of forgot that. But I love what you're talking about, and here's why I think it worked for me. I don't know if it's the same for you, but for me, it's the close-ups. Yes. Close-up on the door. He doesn't do a wide shot of the door when she's trying to close it. You see right up on the door hinge itself on the door knob that it's not matching with the door. It's like overextended on the door, and she can't get it closed. It's the, it's the close-up that does it for me. That's what sells the scene. And then you see the zombie hand creep around the side of the door. That's what works for me in that scene. Yeah. That's why I totally agree with you. That's an incredible scene. And it's that. It's the close-up that does it for me. I love that you mentioned that. No, that's important because it's kind of controlling what you can see. And that kind of can make it scarier. It could yeah. Sometimes wides work really great. 
and we talked about it with with the splinter in the eye but like what the tight does is it makes you go hey but i, I kind of need to see more so i can like orient myself and feel better about what i'm what i'm i'm trying to take this in and i need more information well i'm not going to give you enough information and then when they give you just that hand sliding through you're like oh fuck something super unsettling about it well, and then you don't see the zombie no you don't. you don't you don't ever like that you just know there's something there that makes it that much scary when you don't know what's there you know what i mean mm-hmm. like that makes the it unknown that scary. and so yeah that whole scene works really really well but the close-up and the zombie hand and then breaking through and grabbing her the whole thing works and really all you're seeing are a pair of zombie hands you're not really seeing yeah. anything else in a movie that shows you so much it's such a great scene and it shows you so little yeah. Also, one other thing I want to mention with these zombies that I like in this movie, that, listen, you will not find a bigger George A. Romero fan. And, and, and I, I listen, I know The Walking Dead did not, it, it went out far weaker than it came in. But I still like The Walking Dead. I did enjoy it. But the one kind of problem, I guess, I have with The Walking Dead and a lot of their zombie movies is they make all the zombies, they turn into just like jello. Like, they're super weak, and I understand they're decaying bodies, and they're trying to, like, you know, trying to display that. These zombies, maybe it's because the voodoo, I don't know, but they're strong. Like, they're not oh, like yeah. weak ass, like, you punch them and they fall apart. You know what I mean? Like, they grab the woman's head and drive her into a splinter, and she's resisting. Uh, I like that the zombies have a little bit of girth to them in this movie. They're not just yeah. like, oh, you tap them and they fall over and their head falls off. Like, I kind of like that they're like beefier, scarier zombies. It's it's what sets them apart from all the other zombies, too. Not only are they just that sandy, deteriorated type of zombie, they're a strong zombie, too. They're a slow zombie, Yeah. but don't let them get close enough to you. Just because they're slow doesn't mean they're they're pushovers. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So for my scare, I went a little more traditional for one of the one of the really good surprises in this film. And I'll be honest, when it happened when I watched it last night, I've seen the movie at least five times. And when it happened last night, it still got me. I was like, oh shit, I forgot. Like I kind of <laughs> forgot. It's Dr. Menard when he gets bitten by the zombie out of nowhere. When they closed yeah. off this entire clinic, they they did the whole shots of closing out the doors. The one zombie gets through, they cut his head off. Like they've really fortified this zombie and our entire POV for this scene is the zombies coming towards the front door. So they're all like kind of getting to where they're gonna bang on the front door and they're all preparing for this front assault on the building. And Dr. Menard's in his office, he just turns around the zombies there and bites his face. <laughs> it's a good, effective jump scare. And at that moment, I kind of forgot it existed because I was like, this is a movie more about gore and effect and not really about a good, effective scare. That did. That worked. I was like, oh, I forgot about Dr. Menard getting his face bitten off. <laughs> well, hey, if you're going to throw out plot and good story, you might as well give us every type of scare you can give us. I feel like they really do that in this. Yeah, that was an effective one, though. Like, that was yeah. one where I was like, oh, shit, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> By the way, speaking of Dr. Bernard, I love how his running theme is that basically every few minutes you have to cut to him shooting a wrapped up body in a bag. <laughs> <laughs> like, like it, it starts the movie, and then about every 10 minutes or so, we cut back to Dr. Bernard as another body rises up out of the bed, and he shoots it. I go, that's kind of his thing. That's what he does in this movie. I do I do like the, again, we're talking about what kind of, you know, what kind of limited budget they had to work with. I I do enjoy the the sack over the zombie head and then like the squib they use to explode the blood when the blood when the bullet hits it really yeah. cool actually it's a really cool effect in this movie like when they blow the bag apart and the blood goes flying when they kill the zombies i was like that's actually that actually looks really good as well like even that's even that effect works really well yeah no i mean we're about to talk about best gore do you have anything else to say because no, i, I kind of want to piggyback onto that with best yeah. gore this movie had a I had a laundry list for gore that I don't remember like I kind of I remembered my key scenes and I was like okay yeah I know what we're I know what we're definitely going to talk about but when I when I looked at my list when I was done my gore list was huge like a terrifier two size list like they go for it in this movie and that's one of the great examples too every time he 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 pops a blanketed zombie their head kind of flops open and it looks bad I'm like are they really killing fuckers? Because it, it's <laughs> this is Italian horror. We're they, talking didn't about. Fight a, they didn't actually fight a fucking shark. So. You really fought a shark. Are we shooting people too? <laughs> Wouldn't shock me. So, some un, <laughs> some unearthed documentary from like 1981 where the documentarians go missing like Blair Witch Project. They're like, <laughs> we found out that Lucio Fulci was actually killing people. 
<laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but I mean, it's that good. It's it's good enough that it sells that way. It is. It really is. So what was your best score, though? What was your overall best score? My best score was Susan, our skin diver. Um, I totally forgot because I, I just assumed it was going to be the eye thing because it, it that's a great piece of gore. Uh, but I, when Susan gets killed in the in the uh, graveyard, the way her neck rips open and the just geyser of blood coming out of it, it's it feels so seamless. Like you know, it's fake. You can see that the the material is not human skin. Like it's it's very clearly like kind of white or something like that. The colors and, a little off too. Yeah, like, colors off. You know, you can tell. But there's just something about they know when to cut from like a real person to that skin back to a real person and just to show it shows it so effectively and i was so impressed and, and for susan barely getting really any screen time other than to watch her strip down um she got an incredible gory death yeah that was a really cool one and that's like that is the 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 uh, worm filled eyed zombie the conquistador mm -hmm. zombie just going straight for the jugular literally rips her throat out and it's really gross because, like, when he does it, man, he rips it straight out, too. Like, there was no playing around. There was no, I'm biting your shoulder. No, I'm going to bite your freaking neck off. And yeah. when he does, man, he bites, bites a huge chunk, and the blood just goes pouring out. Like, they really, yeah. like, they use a lot of blood budget on that one scene. Yeah, yeah. I got I'm curious what the blood budget was for this one. So my favorite gore, originally I was going to go with the eyeball because that's so iconic. Well, we've already talked about the eyeball, and I know we're going to talk about the eyeball again. That's an e I, I don't want to go easy here, Patrick. I want to go a little deeper. Okay. I, I, and honestly, this is one of my favorite gore scenes because it's something, once again, we talk about, like, zombies, like, we talk about, like, in other zombie films, like, they just look like people with a little bit of makeup on them. They don't really look scary. It's what they're doing is scary. Yeah. Okay. My favorite gore in this film is after the the four people arrive at Dr. Menard's house and they open the door and Susan lets out another blood curdling scream when they see two zombies munching on Mrs. Menard. Mm -hmm. That to me is one of the best scenes because I actually really enjoy, weirdly, when you're talking about a zombie film, every zombie film or TV show, and again, I know we keep going back to The Walking Dead, but we could talk about any any major zombie film out there almost every major zombie film is about to bite right they bite you and they might bite some skin off and eat that skin but it's about to bite right what i always loved about romero's films especially in day of the dead which i referenced earlier is he actually shows the zombies full on having a dinner mm -hmm. like with the with the dark with the the colonel with the military guy in day of the dead where they're literally just feasting on his guts I love when you walk in on Mrs. Menard and they're just full on pulling body and it's so disgusting. Like pulling <laughs> full on bloody parts out of her midsection, her wrist, and they're just like, blah, blah, blah. like it's just yeah. so real and it's so disgusting. And it's just man, it's like I, I'm not saying like I'm rooting for deaths like that, but I'm like, I'm glad like these are flesh eating monsters. Them biting you is not what they're there for. They're there to have you for dinner. So yeah. after they killed Mrs. Menard and they gouged her eye out, they're like, oh, it's dinner time. Ring the bell. <laughs> and they start picking her apart. And I love that they actually showed them, and it's just real slow. They pick out a big piece of a gut, and they just start eating it and gnawing on it. It's yeah. really good. The, you have to. That's why this movie's so good. Because they go, we're not going to give you much else in terms of story and plot. So we're really going to give it to you on the gore and the kills. Like, it, thank you. That's why, bringing up Friday the 13th, that's why Friday the 13th got successful. We talked about that when we talked about the original version, why it stood out as a slasher, because other slashers were having weak kills. These are not, zombie does not have weak kills. Zombie right. gets remembered because it's got great kills. It's got great gore. I mean, that's, can that's I give you wonderful. One, can I give you one bone to pick though? I do have one bone to pick. Oh, bone to pick? Bone curious, to pick. curious choice of words. After, yeah, I know. After the scene where the zombies are munching on Mrs. Menard, as they're running out and they run into two more zombies in the hallway and Peter and Brian attack, they kill the zombies. They attack the zombies. Peter pulls off a, uh, like fossilized horn, like a, like a, uh, trophy and he grabs it and he hits the zombie with it and kills it. Now, this is me looking back to 1979. How do you not use the horns to go straight <laughs> to the zombie eyes? 
<laughs> missed opportunity, Lucio Fulci, who's dead, so he was not listening to this. But uh, yeah, like that, he pulls the horn thing off the wall and then he smacks it with the bass. And I'm like, no, turn it around and stab it right through the eyes. You missed the opportunity. You could have had a really cool scene of the of the of the uh, the horns going right through the zombie head. I mean, it's a little realistic. It's kind of like a natural reaction. Like, just get the fuck away from me. I just need a blunt object to shoo to shoo the goddamn thing away from me, as opposed to like something that would be a little more Tarantino or a little bit more like Eli Roth would be the 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 horns gr- straight in. But tell me, I'm not. Come on, tell me, I'm right about that. I wouldn't hate it, come Damon. On, I'm not. Put, I'm I'm not kicking it out of bed, Damon. I think it's a good a, idea. You got, you got two horns on a wall, and you're fighting a zombie. Use the horns. Is all I'm saying. If you got that, if you're gonna use any, like if it was just like some other random like skull in the wall, I get it. You just smash them. But you got a horn. You got a the horn. Was the right horn. there. You know what I mean? Maybe like, they what? tried the horn and it wasn't selling. Maybe, yeah, maybe it didn't work. Maybe it didn't work. I don't know. I guess. Um. What was your, we talked about best gore and best scare. What was your best kill? My best kill was the splinter kill. I, I, you can't not, you can't, you can't deny how great that kill is. Yeah. It's, it's something for the ages. And I, I just felt remiss. Like I, there were a lot of great kills. There's a lot of great gore. There's a lot of aftermath too, which I think is why I think, I think it was easier to pick this one as best kill. It's just so incredible. The the splinter through the eye kill is just it's worth the price of admission. And I've already I said that about something else in this movie already. Yeah. Well, guess and that's got at least two moments where it's worth the price of admission. And this kill is just one for the ages. Yeah, it's uh, it's really good. And the reason I want to reason I mentioned that is because I want to piggyback off of my last answer and say that this is also my best kill for two reasons, because it's a double kill. Because, yes, the splinter through the eye is iconic, but you also get to see them munching on Mrs. Menard. It's like this poor woman did not have an easy way out. Like, you know what I mean? Like, because there's a, there's a world where she gets stabbed through the eye, and, like, yes, it does go in your brain, but maybe she's, like, you know, still twitching on the ground, and then they just start eating her. So it's like yeah. Mrs. Menard really had a rough go of it here. Oh, she had uh, a bad night. So that's my best kill as well because of how drawn out it is. Like not only is it drawn out in the moment where they stab her through the eye with the splinter, but then we find her later just laying on the ground, her wrist is all shattered open, and they're just picking her apart uh, like a Thanksgiving dinner. It's just really like poor Mrs. Menard, man. And she's the one, by the way, in every other horror movie sequence, she's the one who survives because she tells her husband, we need to get out of here. Kim, yeah. like, we need to leave and he's like no no honey no no i'm close to breaking through my discovery to figure out why these people keep coming back from the dead and she's like i want to get out so she was the smart one and then she gets killed the worst she got killed the worst she got double killed it's very like uh, i can't remember the name of the character i want to say it was Lori or whatever in terrifier 2 who gets kind of double killed like you think <laughs> that uh art the clown killed her just maniacally and then he like, kills her again while somebody's watching and yeah. you're just uh, it's very it's very reminiscent of that i i swear if we ever get a, a hold of damien leon he's gonna he's gonna bring this movie up yeah it has to has to let's talk about uh remake sequel or leave it alone that's where we take whatever movie we're reviewing and we basically give the premise of should they remake this movie should they sequelize this movie or should they leave it alone? Now, truth be told, they did sequelize this movie. There were other zombies. There was Zombie Three, and I know I think there was more than that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, so they did sequelize it, but we're just going to go off of this. And Zombie Three technically shouldn't have been Zombie Two because Zombie Two wasn't really Zombie Two. That's why it's just Zombie because it was <laughs> never actually a sequel to Day of the Dead so, or Dawn of the Dead. Excuse me. So yeah, let's, it's a weird one. It's Zombie. Zombie Two is just in Italy, which again never really because day of the dead or excuse me dawn of the dead i keep saying day of the dead dawn of the dead was was zombie in italy that's open to right. zombie in italy with the dario dario argento editing and the and the goblin soundtrack it was open to zombie and so that's why this one was zombie two uh but there was a zombie three i know that for sure but we're gonna eliminate that from our minds so patrick with zombie remake it sequelize it or leave it alone this is a tough one for me because I think, I mean, I think you throw a sequel out right away and it's easy to say, leave it alone. Cause I don't know, you can't really capture, like there's something special about how it all worked in 1979. It looks scary because it's from 1979. Like, I don't know that you can, whatever you do with today's technology or a good budget or whatever, 
you you're something is still going to be lost modernizing it something just will but i would be curious to see a remake just to get a better story in there i think i think that's really all all you need but what this movie gave us instead of a great story is it gave us great moments yeah. that we that we managed to fill an entire podcast with how can i be mad at that i can't be and so I just feel like, and, and, and it's real easy in a remake to do too much story yeah. that can also happen. So while I'm very curious what a remake of this would be in, in the true spirit of it. And somebody with, who truly has reverence for zombie, I say zombie too, cause I'm a, I'm a purist like that, but I'm very like, I'm, I'd be curious to see that, but I'm, I'm more, I'm more happy with the memories that this movie makes so I'm going to stick with leave it alone. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to solidly f- fall on leave it alone um with the exception of if they ever wanted to create like a modern sequel and like yeah. what they've done in like Halloween and what they've done with Exorcist coming up, please don't like screw a requel. Yeah, please don't do it wrong. <laughs> David Gordon Green ends up like Halloween ends and Corey shows up in Exorcist, I'm coming for you. Um <laughs> If they do it like that, where they make it a direct sequel, like where the zombie plague hit New York and they're going to somehow do that, which would kind of seem weird now, 40 years later. But if they wanted to do that, I'd be I'd be moderately interested in that. If somebody really wanted to take a, a stab at doing a full on like Fulci homage, I could I, I could kind of get behind that. Um, the one I'm 100 percent against is remake. And here's why. The things that they did in this movie, you can't do today, particularly as we've already talked about throughout the entire filmmaking process, is you cannot put a human being against a shark in any way, shape, or form, and you're not going to do it. And listen, has CGI come a long way, and are there some amazing, like, amazing versions of CGI? Absolutely. But every shark movie that's ever been made, with the exception of Jaws, um... And some, a couple of the Jaws sequels, well, even actually most of the Jaws sequels are not good either. I'm talking about the effects. The movies are pretty terrible, but like the effects. Yeah. CGI sharks have never looked good. Like I love, it's a really bad, like it's a good, bad movie. I love Deep Blue Sea. I think that's seriously bad, but it's like the sharks. Now, granted, that was 20 years ago when it got made. So even then, CGI is far different, but like CGI sharks never look great. (laughs) And like- I, lo- I listen here's an homage to our horror guys i love james wan and i actually thought the first aquaman was a lot of fun but even the sea life in that movie was pretty you know not great it was not yeah. the best it's hard to recreate that even with cgi so if you redo it you're gonna you're gonna redo those two scenes you're gonna do the splinter in the eye you're gonna redo the sharks there's no way you you could not remake zombie without redoing those two scenes and neither are going to look as good like that's the problem like you're going to use cgi now maybe you if you do practical effects with the eye and you bring in a, a greg nicotero or a damian leon who did a damian leon who did all the terrifier movies all practical effects maybe you could pull it off maybe you can pull off the eye you're not pulling off the shark ramon bravo greatest name in the world he's not here with us anymore okay you're not getting anyone to fight a freaking shark for real so just don't do it don't do it with the cgi shark it's not going to look good. Just don't. That's my that's my entire point. So a sequel, sure, maybe. But even that, I'm kind of like, eh, I'm indifferent to it. I don't, you know, don't really need it. If you really can. And because, again, the story here, like, there's not really a story to carry on the plot. Like, do you really, do we really care what happened to Peter and uh, whatever the, uh, whatever the uh, uh, Tisa Farrow's character name? Uh, <laughs> and and both do we, whatever name we, is are we really emphatically like curious what happened to peter in and after they got back to new york no i mean that's not the point of this movie and that's there's so if you're if it's not the point of the story to carry on then what are you carrying it on for so to me it all falls down and leave it alone because this is iconic this is one of the greatest horror films of all time one of the greatest effects films of all time um and again very light on plot and story so why would you carry it on and then please dear god do not remake this movie because it's not going to be anywhere near as good as what they did in this film can i pitch a sequel to you really quick pitch it let's hear it let just if you bring up Corey, i'm 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 walking away I, I, but, but don't don't count Corey out though like like give him room to show up in the third movie is all i'm saying um no <laughs> like my sequel idea would be let's pick it up in the antilles 
in, with it, whatever in the, in the coming months or weeks or whatever, where there's, there's people on a, on a, on a, you know, an older Island, more Spanish graves somewhere on that Island, please. Cause that, that works out great. And they're hanging out on the, on the shore and they, they look over and they see what they believe is a beached and decomposing shark. <laughs> it's our zombie shark, Damon. And they go, as they go to examine the shark, assuming it's dead because it looks decrepit and all that shit, it swings over, it, that our animatronic shark swings over and bites one of them. And then it like scurries off back into the water. So you only get minimalist moments of it. But what if the, what if the infection spreads from the zombie shark? I'd be on board for that. Or if you could do really good effects... And I do mean like Steven Spielberg. Well, I may be beyond that, but like really, really good effect. <laughs> um, you could do a zombie shark movie, and I probably would go see that. Like you could have, like, you'd see zombie, it. You could see like a zombie attacks a boat. You know what I mean? And it's like oh, they're, yeah. they're stuck in the water. Their uh, their engine breaks or whatever, and there's like ten of them on a boat, and they just start getting picked off by the zombie shark. I could I could spend an hour and a half in the theater watching that movie. Oh, you, I know you could, Damon. I know you've you've got it in you. <laughs> but but again, like I said, if we're just basing it on story, it's not really a story to carry on here. So yeah, but yeah, or again, it, like what I actually thought you were gonna say. I'm glad you went to Zombie Shark. I was to say like you could potentially have people just show up on this island, and the island is the story. You know, people just yeah have to fall upon you know Mapool, M- Matool, and they just fight Matool, yeah. and they're like oh we we found a cool little cove hideaway not knowing what they've fallen into that could be a sequel i don't really care about peter and ann whatever they're back in new york do whatever they're you know I don't, i'm not concerned <laughs> with them but if you want to have people go to Matool and they end up falling into like zombie central yeah okay i could promise you that the character of ann is pregnant within two weeks of the end of this movie <laughs> they just they just they were too horny for no good reason either like there, there's one moment where like her ankles all fucked up and bleeding and he's like trying to tend to it and then they just, they just start making out <laughs> it's like guys priorities yeah there was actually a discussion they did a zombie episode on this season about the uh, at last drive-in with uh, joe bob briggs and the great darcy the male girl and they had ian mcculloch on the guy who played peter and he actually asked him at one point, Joe Bob Briggs asked him at one point, and he's just like, so were Peter and Anne supposed to be falling in love? Like, what was going on? Like, was that actually part of the story? Because it was never really quite made clear. And he was just like, yeah, I don't really know. He's like, we were on the boat, and we had, like, fake make out, and it was really odd. So, yeah, it was just like, no one really knows. Like, were you falling in love? Was it like there was there actually a love story there? It was weird. Um, yeah, I, I'm with you there. It was an odd one. Um Let's talk about what has become my favorite category on the show, Patrick, and that is, can we survive this horror film? So, put ourselves on that boat. Um, I'm not the one naked scuba diving. That's going to to you, man. Uh, Bye. I'll be Susan. Are we, are we surviving this horror film? Boy, oh boy. I don't know who's choose to put myself in, but I got to say this. Everybody on that boat was on Quaaludes, <laughs> like 100%. And they some like our main characters somehow made it out alive. If they made it out alive, why the fuck can't I make it out alive? That's yeah. what I'm gonna say. But are you able to resist your horniness enough that you could resist? No, 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 no. <laughs> but but what I'm saying is the two people who engaged in all the horniness, they survived. So I'm like, uh, based on all the evidence that these people are clearly on quaaludes and rose. And like that's just all they've been doing the entire shoot and they still make it out i can make it out i think so so i'm gonna say with a firm with a firm feeling in my eyes i would survive this and here's why i've had a, i've had a, like all the horror movie situations you put yourself in and i'm talking about like the iconic genres you know what i mean like you know yeah. alien attack slasher uh haunted house like all these kind of things like there's certain genres like i know i would survive i always said the two i would survive best at of all of them and i guarantee you there's a lot of slashers i would die slasher is my favorite genre guarantee i'd be dead in at least 60 percent of those the two genres where i always feel i would survive one haunted house because as i said in our episode talking about uh insidious i would just get the fuck out 
Uh, now, I understand the insidious, it follows the kid. Well, guess what? I would abandon the kid. I don't care if it's my father. Uh, I'm gone. Um, so, yeah, haunted house stories. I've always said I would survive haunted house stories because I'm not the idiot who's going to be like, oh, I don't understand why there's blood in the toilet bowl. I'm out. <laughs> so that's one. The other one, and this is bad. I'm going to let a little secret about myself here, Patrick. I'm going to let I'm gonna let our audience in to know the real Damon right now, and it might terrify you a little bit. I've always said in a zombie apocalypse, I would 100% turn into Negan from The Walking Dead. I would be the guy who would become the dystopian warlord because I'm like, it's my time. Uh, so I would survive because I would 100% be the guy to grab the horns off the head, stab the zombie through the head with both those horns, then take that as a weapon, break the two horns off, and carry those as my stabbing weapons as I walk across the island. I can improvise, buddy. I can improvise. Now, they improvise with Molotov cocktails. Give them credit for that. I would I would, I would, would have full-on, like, shields and stabbing weapons and fiery Molotov cocktails. <laughs> I would survive this. I've always said, outside of the cardio aspect from Zombieland, where you got to run, I'm not, that, I'm not a fast runner. If that's what you're getting me to survive with, maybe I die. But just on pure, like, instinct to kill and survive zombies... I'm your guy. I am the guy you want around, man. I will improvise weapons. I will kill at will. I will save you. Get behind me is all I'm saying. So 100% I'm surviving this horror film because, like I said, if I'm confident in any, in any genre of horror film, it's haunted houses because I would run. No, <laughs> no bones about it. Zombie films because I am twisted enough to where I'll be like, bring it on <laughs> yeah i'm like damon we're getting on the boat and you're like chasing zombies they're running away from you as you're trying, trying to fucking bash them over the head yeah i got my stabbing weapons like Come here, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> i'm like get on the boat i'm not clothed get on the boat i'm naked on this boat let's go the scuba gear's falling off i got nothing yeah to right now. <laughs> i'm getting out of my clothes and into my scuba suit <laughs> Oh my god! Yeah, there's a good reason why they didn't do. Yeah, there's a good reason they didn't do a nude guy under the water with a zombie and a shark. Uh, not, I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna crude here and say why, but I think there's a reason why that didn't happen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just putting it out there. Listen, I'm just, uh, you're right. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm, you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> Uh, all right, last category is always, Patrick. We would talk about Zombie, the 1979 slash 1980 classic, because, again, it didn't open to the U.S. till 1980, which is the anniversary part of the reason we're doing the podcast today. Zombie, is it scary? Patrick, is it scary? It is in that good old-fashioned, weird, uncanny valley that is the late 70s. There's great gore. The zombies look very authentic. Um, a guy fights a shark, a real shark. It actually happens. If you don't find this thrilling, check your pulse. You could be dead. You could be one of the undead. It's entirely possible. This this gives you all the thrills and chills and titillation that a Italian horror is supposed to. And uh, and for that, I I can't deny it. It's a scary movie. It absolutely is a scary movie. And because one thing I love about zombie films is while they do give you the occasional jump scare, you know, zombie turning around the corner and biting someone, as I mentioned with Dr. Bernard or any, and there's a lot of great zombie films where it's like, you know, zombie comes out of nowhere and bites you good jump scare. Right. But most zombie films don't beat you over the head with jump. Like really good zombie films don't beat you over the head with jump scares. It's really the dread and the terrifying zombies coming at you. You know, they're coming. It's getting away from them or, or, you know, barricading yourself in a building to get away from them or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that's what you're, that's what's scary about, about zombie films is that it's not that you're, you know, you turn the corner every time and there's a zombie there while that does work, uh, you know, in certain situations, it's the the hordes of the undead coming for you and wanting to you know, bite your flesh off your bone. Um, this film does that really, really well. The whole scene in the clinic is great. The Molotov cocktails getting dropped. The, the fire, which, by the way, can I can I also I talk about the, the criticizing of the horns, using the horn as a weapon and not a stabbing weapon? Can I also say, do we really want zombies set on fire? Is that really the best way to kill them? Because chances are they're going to, like, they shoot so many zombies in the chest and the back in this movie, and I'm like, did anyone figure out maybe you need to shoot them in the head? They finally do figure that out at one point. Um, but I will give credit. One thing that I always, will, always bugs the hell out of me with zombie movies, 
every zombie movie, every person that picks up a gun suddenly becomes a military sharpshooter. <laughs> you realize how hard it is to shoot something at like 20 yards away and actually be accurate at it? Especially Mary. when you're like running or something. Like every zombie movie, you turn into like the, the sharpshooter who's up like on a ridge at like 300 yards shooting down there with like a sniper rifle. Uh, every every movie, John Wick. Yeah, everybody's like full on headshots all the time. Like you never miss. They miss all the time in this movie. <laughs> they don't hit shit in this movie. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, that like that that's the thing with the, with this one. But yeah, I would say that yeah, it's scary because um, the zombies are terrifying. They all work. They all look great. Um, the scenes like we talked about with the zombie coming after the wife in the house is scary, and it's even scary because you don't see the zombie running away from the zombies in the uh, the flaming zombies in the clinic the whole thing is just it works really really well the effects are brilliant um yeah it's a scary film and it still holds it's it it blew me away patrick watching this last night and i was like this was made in 1979 and this looks better than like 90 percent of the horror movies like effects wise that i see today damon it looks better than the new Indiana Jones movie. It does. Like you, you gotta be, I'm not fucking around. It's not hyperbole. And I, and I, I have parts of the new Indiana Jones I actually like, but it's so covered in CG yeah. that it doesn't look real. You just, you're like, Oh, I'm watching like a lot, like an extended video game, like uh, you know, a uh, cinema scene or whatever. You it just doesn't made, look real. You could have just made an animated movie with Harrison Ford voiceovers. Yeah, I mean, they might as well, they should have just done that. I think that, that would have been better, but I digress. The point is, is like this movie, you can taste it, you can feel it, you can touch it. And I and believe me, I know Lucio Fulci wanted you to reach out and touch this movie. Yeah. I guarantee you. And it, 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 it sells on every level. Works so well. Yeah, pay attention. Like, and listen, I know we've said, I know I've said this. I won't speak for you when I say this, Patrick. I'm a practical effects guy. Now, I'm not saying you can't use CGI or digital effects in the right moments. Absolutely, you can, and certain yeah. films are better for it. Of course they are, but I love practical effects. I will, if, there is a, if there is a version and a good version of practical effects versus digital, I will always choose practical. That's one of the reasons, like I said, I mean, I love Terrifier 2, one of my favorite films last year, but a big part of my love for that film and even the original are the practical effects it goes back to old school 80s horror when you know you actually had practical effects for everything now did everything look great in the 80s of course not a lot of it looked terrible but when you do really good practical effects they just work so much better they look so much more real yeah. um, nothing nothing in this world looks worse than digitized blood it is the worst mm -hmm. they do a lot of digital effects with gunshots now where it's digital blood and it always looks terrible. I don't care if it's the biggest budget movie in the world, digital blood always looks bad. So yeah. practical effects, horror films, I'm 100% that guy. Give me that every single time. And they give it to you in this movie. Boy, they give it to you hard. They do, man, they do. <laughs> so Lucio Fulci so far is one and two for me on this podcast. I was not the biggest fan of New York Ripper, but I freaking love Zombie. Zombie is an all time classic. It is amazing. Um, yeah, man. And right now it's on it's on Shutter. So go watch it. Hey Shutter. Hey uh, Shutter. It's over there. So go check it out on Shutter right now. And incredible if you've never seen Zombie Man, I mean, I think most people listen to the show probably have. But if you haven't, run. Run. Go see it. Take off your clothes, put on some scuba gear and sit around <laughs> and watch Zombie. I promise you. It is worth Close it. off, snorkel on. And that's coming from me personally, the host of this show, Ramon Bravo. No. <laughs> watch zombie. at ramon bravo on twitter <laughs> at ramon bravo I'm, I'm not even kidding i might change my name to ramon. <laughs> all right folks that is our show for this week we appreciate everyone tuning into the show if you ever got questions comments movies you'd like us to review on the show uh hit us up on email rot living dead at gmail.com that's rot living dead at gmail.com you can also find us on all of your favorite social media platforms twitter instagram and facebook just search rewind of the living dead you'll find us over there we post the new episodes each and every week and you can also uh, hit us up with questions comments or movies you'd like us to review on there and you can also hit us up on our own personal social media channels i am at damon martin and you are 
at director patrick and you can always find us on all of your favorite podcast platforms apple Podcasts, spotify iHeartRadio, and of course our youtube channel just search youtube uh, at rewind of the living dead youtube.com at rewind of the living dead and you'll find our youtube page go over there and find us anytime and we will be glad to uh, service you and you can actually look at us actually right now if you don't know you if you're not watching you'd never know patrick is nude in his scuba gear you would never know that if you're not watching this on youtube right now you're missing out. I'm covered in sand, worms in my eyes, and nothing else on. See, you won't know. You won't know for sure if we're serious or not. Tune in, subscribe. It's the only way to what? find out. Only way to know. It's throughout the entire podcast. What you're not seeing is Patrick is just gradually taking off his clothes during the podcast <laughs> while putting on scuba gear. It's been really, been really unsettling on the other end of the <laughs> here. But that's what's been happening. Tune on to YouTube, and you'll find out. Yeah, yeah. You don't don't miss out on that extra layer of this podcast. <laughs> That's what you're missing out on right now. <laughs> All right, folks, that is our episode for this week. We will be back next week. Actually, let me just go ahead and throw a teaser out here. In a matter of days, Patrick and I are going to be together in the same city. Once I'm a gonna, year, it happens. I, once a year, I go to I go to San Diego for Comic Con, and I will be in in Patrick's corner of the world. If he greets me nude in a scuba suit, I'm turning right around to leave. <laughs> Damon, where are you going? Hey, get back here, man. <laughs> but yes, we'll be in the same city and hopefully watching a horror movie together in a matter of days. That's the plan. I would love to be able to to get a get a horror movie together while you're out here. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the, the hosts of Rewind of Living Dead will actually be in the same city for only the second time that we've been doing this show in like four years. Uh, so yeah, it'll be good times. Uh, all right, folks, that is our show. We appreciate everyone tuning in as each and every week. Uh, we will see you next week for another edition of Rewind of the Living Dead. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you then. Peace. <laughs>